Right now, North Korean state media says that Pyongyang has ordered missiles at the ready to strike both South Korea and the United States. I'm Rockman Johnson. This is Bounce TV News at 7. Thanks so much for being here. Now, North Korea's, Korea's leader is stepping up his threats of war with the United States, and he's backing up his talk. Chris Lawrence with CNN has the latest. Pentagon officials were in no mood to back down hours after flying a stealth bomber over the Korean Peninsula. We will uh, unequivocally uh, defend and we are unequivocally committed to that alliance with South Korea. The bombers could carry up to 20 tons of conventional and nuclear ordnance. On Thursday, two B-2s took off from an Air Force base in Missouri. They flew 6,600 miles to a training exercise and dropped inactive payload on a South Korean island. Why do you think it's wise for the U.S. to respond and, and poke back at, at some of these North Korean provocations? Well, I don't think we're uh, poking back or responding. The North Koreans have to understand that um, uh, what they're doing is, is very dangerous. But even the defense secretary admitted the U.S. is not sure how its actions are being interpreted in North Korea. There is uncertainty uh, in that government and in their leadership and intentions. Pyongyang recently released intimidating new photos of its army and artillery. These are real enough, but North Korea is known to exaggerate its abilities. This shot of a beach landing exercise appears to be photoshopped. Some of the hovercraft look exactly alike. But there is genuine concern over a new missile North Korea unveiled at a parade last year. That road mobile missile uh, would have the capacity to reach the United States. Uh, that's a different type of missile from the one that was tested back in December. Uh, and because it's road mobile, I think that it has raised concerns. Now that mobile missile hasn't been tested, so no one's sure exactly where North Korea is in the development process, but its potential existence, in addition to North Korea's recent missile and nuclear tests, makes officials in the U.S. very concerned. Chris Lawrence, CNN, the Pentagon. Now on Skype, we've got Hayden Sims, who was a delegate to the Model UN and a graduate student uh, right now. Uh, Hayden, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for joining us. And let's get right to it. You had a chance to participate with the Model United Nations, and you've participated with students from all over the world. How serious is this threat that we look that's coming from North Korea? Well, uh, there are many different dynamics at work here. Uh, if you look at the history of uh, North Korea in their actions, they've always done these types of things. Uh, you look at uh, 2010, for example, where North Korea actually sunk a South Korean naval vessel, and there was no retaliation really on the part of the international community. So this would seem as if uh, just, I guess, another, I guess, attempt uh, by the North Koreans to get international notoriety, get the attention of the United States. Uh, as per the missiles uh, that they have supposedly aimed at the United States, uh, there's no evidence uh, that they have the potential to strike the U.S. mainland. Now, uh, South uh, Korea, on the other hand, Hawaii and Guam, uh, that's another story. They may indeed have the potential uh, to strike these uh, areas. But uh, as it stands now, uh, it seems uh, more of a ploy you know, on the new leader uh, you know, to get more international notoriety on the part of North Korea. So what do you think they want? What is it that America or the United Nations can do to say, hey, come to the table, talk to us? What do you think they want? Well, as we saw with, uh, you know, the widely reported on visit by Dennis Rodman, uh, <laughs> the message he brought back was that uh, Kim Jong-un uh, really wants to talk to the president of the United States. This is what he wants. He wants the attention of America. He wants to be seen on the same standing as, of, uh, as America. Uh, this is why, of course, they're pursuing these uh, nuclear potentials because they see this uh, as the end to being equal. Now, whether or not it's a threat to the international community, uh, it could be. Uh, it, uh, well, it is. So right now uh, we just it, have to wait and see what happens next. We would have to wait and see what happens next. Gotcha. Uh, I, you know, it's a nuclear threat, you know, exactly. uh, at the end of the day. So exactly. Yes, Thank you so much. Threat. Hayden Thank Sims, you. who was a delegate to the model United Nations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. If you have any threat against the school, a person, uh, the building, whatever it may be, you have to take it serious.
Now, a high school student in Iowa is facing felony charges after allegedly posting a bomb threat against her school on Facebook. The 16 year old girl posted that she wanted to put an incendiary device or bomb in some type of Pella High School place. She also threatened a staff member and Pella police charged the girl with the threat of arson. Now, that's a class D felony in Iowa. The school officials said they don't believe the high school is in any danger, but authorities say that threats to school state safety are always taken seriously and the teens need to understand that they can face major consequences for posting something online. Now, last week, you may remember two teens were accused of making threats to a rape victim in Steubenville, Ohio. Now, here with us to discuss this is Kaylee, Kaylee Bordenkircher. Uh, Kaylee is uh, joining us via Skype, and Randall Vickers, who's a licensed counselor, uh, he's joining us on the phone. Randall, how are you? Kaylee, are you with us? Randall, Randall, thank you so much. Yeah. Why do you think kids these days are, uh, we're going to talk to Kaylee Borgenkircher as well, who is uh, training to do what you do with kids, but the question is, you're a licensed family therapist here in Florida. Um, why is it you think that kids are making these kind of threats via social media? Well, social media is so easily accessible and it's ubiquitous in terms of uh, anyone can do anything, make any kind of threat, and there's very little breaks uh, on you know, uh, students, adolescents who have either not matured or have, you know, issues that have not been dealt with. And uh, Kaylee, how much, uh, how many students are you seeing come to you with this type, type of violence who are being bullied online? Um, I've had actually a few come to me. Um, I've just been working with the students uh, the last year. And I want to say it's a good handful that have come to me with different issues of being bullied online, you know, through Facebook, through email. Wow. Wow. Now, Randall, in your practice, do you see kids coming and what are things that obviously the main thing is go and tell somebody, tell your parents, tell a teacher. But what can kids do to protect themselves and what can parents do to protect their kids from this kind of action? Well, again, uh, one of the problems is the kids don't know who to go to. Uh, you know, there's so much alienation between parents and teachers and adults. Kids talk very much among themselves, but they have a real hard time finding any adult that they can feel comfortable with even to report things like this unless they might have a good school resource officer or a good uh, school counselor but very often they really don't see anyone they can talk to. Mm, mm. Kaylee have, have you experienced any problems with any of the kids that you see where uh, you've actually seen the bullies or dealt with the bullies have you had that happen? Um, I have not dealt with the bullies myself normally that ends up being um, administration um, sometimes it even goes as far as contacting the SRO for the school or um, the community cops as well. Mm -hmm. um, normally they come to me, confide in me, and then I find um, further resources for them um, to discuss with their issues that are happening. Gotcha. Randall, Kaylee, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And if okay. you have an issue with bullying and you need some help, you can go to our website, bouncenews.tv, and we'll give you some of the resources you can use to help yourself. Now, coming up just ahead on Bounce News at 7, it's water games in the urinal. Yeah, could this be the new trend? <laughs> and it's a hot topic why some think that restaurants are serving up obesity. We'll be right back. Now, forget about gangsters and bank robbers. The most popular document in old FBI case files has to do with UFOs. That's right, unidentified flying objects. Brian Todd takes a look at the flying saucer report that's captivated the country. It's called The Vault, the FBI's digital reading room, where any of us can go online and view the Bureau's most notorious cases. Guess which is the most popular file? John Dillinger's? Jimmy Hoffa's? Nope. Since we opened The Vault, uh, it's been this memo uh, about flying disks or flying saucers, and it relates to an allegation that we heard from a third hand you know, saying that the Air Force had found a couple of, of saucers out in the New Mexico desert. No, no, can't be. I mean, most people want to read about Machine Gun Kelly and Al Capone, right? You would think so, but this memo itself has gotten over a million page views in two years since we put it up. Al Capone uh, doesn't make our top 50. The memo's all of two paragraphs. Agent Guy Hoddle, then head of the FBI's Washington field office, writes that an Air Force investigator stated that three so-called flying saucers had been recovered in New Mexico. They were described as being circular in shape with raised centers, approximately 50 feet in diameter. Not only that, 
Each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape, but only three feet tall, dressed in metallic cloth of a very fine texture. Each body was bandaged in a manner similar to the blackout suits used by speed flyers and test pilots. John Fox is the FBI's historian. This was never followed up on, right? No. In fact, it says right here, no further evaluation was attempted concerning the above. Why not? Um, from what's written here, uh, from what we can read, it certainly looks like they thought that this was you know, third-hand information, that this was not necessarily a hoax, which it could well have been, but that you know, someone was simply reporting hearsay. And it was more for the Air Force to look into, along with countless other reports of UFOs in Roswell, New Mexico and elsewhere, reports that were never substantiated. One reason the memo from Agent Hoddle went viral is because when the FBI vault was set up online two years ago, tabloids seized on that memo, saying it appeared to back up theories that aliens exist. And it's not just the Guy Hoddle memo that's a favorite. There are hundreds of other pages of memos and files in the FBI vault in the unexplained phenomenon section all about alien and UFO sightings that are more popular online than the FBI's files on Bonnie and Clyde, serial killer Ted Bundy, and other famous cases. Cases involving Osama bin Laden, investigations into the murders of civil rights leaders, all part of FBI lore. Fox says out of all the strange cases he's come across, the descriptions here of, you know, 50 foot diameter saucers and human shaped three foot tall metallic clothed <laughs> uh, aliens, that, that's unique. And we can say a little frustrating for FBI officials who tell us it diverts attention from all the work they've done, all the dangers they've faced through the years to capture fugitives and solve the nation's most difficult crimes. And we're joined here by Chief Science Officer Casanova Nurse. And Casanova, I know you got on a dark suit, but you're not men in black. No, so. no, no. I don't have the sunglasses yet. <laughs> so I got to ask, though, is Area 51 real? Area 51 Area does 51. not exist oh. officially. Yeah, but, right. Yeah, right. But there is an area which is part of Edwards Air Force Base in Nevada, which is commonly referred to as Area 51, but that's not the official name for it. They did a lot of the Air Force did a lot of experimental test flights and aircraft uh, activities and projects in that zone. And I think that's where a lot of people make that connection where uh, it's more known for perhaps UFO landings and alien uh, wow. research and things like that. So you know science, obviously you're our science guy. Can, is there life on other planets? I know that's a, a million dollar question, but is there life on other planets? It's tough to believe in this huge expansive universe that this one teeny tiny spot is the only place that supports life. And that's one of our goals when it comes to experimenting and sending out air, uh, spacecraft, uh, the, the Mars rover, getting the samples of the soil and finding some uh, indications of life supporting elements that were there. So there's no solid evidence quite yet, but the research is still underway and there's still a whole lot of exploration to do. So the FBI may know something about what's out there. They may know a little something, <laughs> and, and there has been some indication that they've done some work in that field, but just no proof. Gotcha. Casanova Nurse, our chief science officer, thanks so much. All right. Just ahead on Bounce News at 7, adults are sending more text messages than teens today. Who would have thought it? We'll tell you what one of the major companies is saying about the phenomenon. We'll be right back. Have you ever been guilty of texting and driving? Turns out those who do it may not be who you'd think. Now, a new survey conducted by, by AT&T found 49% of adult commuters attempted to text and drive. Now, that's compared to 43% of teens. And of those, 98% said they know it's unsafe, 40% admit it's a habit, and they said they shouldn't be doing it, but they do. Now, here to discuss this with us is AT&T spokesperson Joe Chandler on the phone. Hey, Joe. Hey, good evening. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. So what is AT&T doing with this brand new uh, uh, site or this site you guys are doing to hopefully curtail texting and driving? Well, at AT&T, we've been involved in trying to drive awareness of this issue uh, for about four years now. And during that time, we've done three different surveys and the results every time were very revealing. And, and this time they certainly were revealing. Uh, you mentioned the numbers. And so... Over the last year, we've been very focused on driving awareness of the dangers of texting and driving to teenagers uh, doing hundreds of events at, at high schools around the country. Uh, the results of this survey indicate that we need to now turn some attention and drive awareness to those adult commuters 
who freely admit, at least almost half of them, that they do it on a regular basis. Did you think that this many adults were text messaging? We only have a few seconds, but did you think that this many adults were text messaging over teenagers? I think it was a very uh, surprising finding. And uh, although in our earlier survey of, of teenagers, they, they um, reported that, that they had seen, you know, 77% of them said, we've seen our parents do it. So we followed that survey with this one, and, and the survey results are very revealing. Gotcha. Well, Joe, thanks so much. We're going to be sharing some information on our website, bouncenews.tv, of course, uh, and in our next segment about how uh, everyone else can make sure that they're keeping in the right and not texting and driving. Thanks so much, Joe. You're welcome. Thank you. Still ahead on Bounce, it's your best life. How you can say no to text messaging and driving. We'll be right back. In today's Your Best Life, we saw those stunning statistics that more adults than teens are sending text messages and texting while driving. Now, in just a few moments, that text that you send or read could take your eyes off the road long enough to cause a serious accident or worse. Really, it can't wait. You think you're just checking your messages or telling a friend you're on your way. They could be the last words you ever type. Make sure you get where you're going. So here's how you can get involved. First, by saying no to texting and driving, and then you can log on to itcanwait.com, or you can get a kit to get registered and take the pledge yourself. You can also go to iihs.org laws to see where your state stands in texting while driving. So all you have to do to stop text messaging is stop doing it. Log on. It could make the difference. That's another key to living your best life. Thanks so much for spending your evening with us. We'll see you tomorrow right here on Bounce News at 7. Have a wonderful night.